Good morning, Knicks Nation. Today is Thursday, the 30th day of December 2021. I hope you're all healthy and COVID-free today. I hope your family's safe, healthy, and COVID-free, and that the needs of you and your family in terms of food, shelter, clothing, as well as health are being met. Blessings upon those that work in the healthcare field, along with all the first responders that respond to accidents, that respond to emergencies, that respond to natural disasters, all trying to save lives. Blessings upon those that pick up garbage for us to keep streets and sidewalks clean. Blessings upon those that make deliveries for our convenience. Double blessings on those trying to help deliver and rescue boys and girls, men and women, children, toddlers, teenagers, from pornography, child pornography, prostitution, child prostitution, human trafficking, sex slavery, pedophilia, child molestation, and double curses on the perverts and the grimy people that are responsible for these things. Finally, blessings upon the homeless, 600,000 men, women, and children without a roof over their head in the United States today and millions around the world in similar or worse conditions. Blessings upon them, for theirs is the kingdom. Last night, there was a basketball game. It was in Detroit. Our New York Knicks defeated the Detroit Pistons 94-85. Before I get into the game, I'd like to, most of the time, if you guys have been watching my channel for a while, you will notice that most of the time, I'd say conservatively 75% of the time, maybe higher, I completely disagree <laughs> with most of what Nick commentators are saying. I completely just usually don't even see it the same way, you know, usually. I don't know. It's just because I understand that they are, they being platform, big platforms on television and some YouTube channels. Most of those people see it, uh, looking at it from entertainment value only. And I understand sports is entertainment, no doubt about it. And so they're looking to sell the entertainment value, the entertainment structure. And so everything in their commentary is built around that. Whereas I am a Nick fanatic. So that being the case, I'm looking strictly at basketball. What I know about basketball, I've learned about basketball, what I see about basketball in terms of how can my team win? Where is my team at? What is my team doing or need to do? And that's, I'm so we're looking at it differently, but it starts to get a little scary. When I am actually agreeing with people like Wally Zerbiak <laughs> and Alan Hahn, I'm actually agreeing. And I want to play a little clip from their post-game comments because what I'm going to say today plays into that. And let's, let's listen. Listen to it. What about the lack of cohesion among the starting five, Wally? I mean, this is getting, a, I mean, this has got to be cause for concern. It's a real cause for concern. What is it? Because Kemba Walker all of a sudden is not doing what he did over those four great games. His knee did not look good tonight. Mm -hmm. It looked like he didn't have that burst to get into the paint and make things happen off the pick and roll. So he's going to struggle on back-to-backs. I don't know what's going on with Julius Randle. I mean, maybe there's something going on with his knee. He was rubbing it last night in the Minnesota game, but he just does not. His body language on the court. No. When he goes when he goes to set a screen, he just stands there like this. He doesn't set a screen like Todd Gibson sets a screen to get his Emmanuel quickly an open three, and he gets him a wide open three. Julius Randle could do the same thing for any guard in that starting unit, but he doesn't even look engaged when he goes to set a screen, which is part of a play in the NBA. Like setting screens, cutting hard, making your defender work. That's a big part of why units and teams are successful in the NBA. And he has to figure out a way to get engaged with that starting unit and be a leader by example. Yeah, it's something with Randall that, that last season he really quieted a lot of critics. This season, those critics have reason now to come back. Just not making the shots that he made last year. That's Y'all heard all that? <sighs> So let's start with this. Now we're going to talk about the win, right? And what caused the win, obviously. But yesterday uh, on Twitter, I saw that someone had, uh, one of the writers had announced that Thibodeau did not have Kemba Walker on the injured list. 
And why was that important? Because you would expect him to sit. Why? Because of his knee. Right? And that was an issue even coming into the season where we were like, they were asking, you know, so he's going to play back to backs. And, and Tom said, yeah, he's going to play. <laughs> but I thought, and a lot of us thought he was kidding. He's not going to play Kemba Walker back to back with that knee. Then last week after Kemba was sitting for three weeks now, sitting, he comes back and he's playing 35, 40 minutes and he's, you know, he's the Kemba we expected. But, some of us were also wondering, how long could he do that? Because we know that knee was a problem. Okay? The knee was a problem. Such a problem that Boston had to sit him part of last year. Same issues. And we started seeing it in the 20 games this year. He started off strong. And all of a sudden, as time went on, he got weaker. Now, he said he just was trying to defer. Him. No, it wasn't that. His knee. Okay. Now, we talked yesterday about how there's a young man behind him that's ready. Not, not, we don't need no more development. I mean, he's going to develop more. Obviously, he's a young player, but he's ready to take over now. He's ready to be handed the keys to this car right now. He's got his license and he's ready to drive. He has no knee issues. He has no health issues. He can play 40 minutes a night. But the old vet don't want to give up that spot. And that's what led Kemba Walker to play yesterday. You see, y'all expecting Tom Thibodeau to say, oh, I'm going to manage Kemba. Tom don't do that. Y'all should know Tom don't do that. If you say you read, and I agree with this in this aspect. If you're an NBA player and you say, I'm ready to play, that means you're ready to go out there and play 30, 40, whatever I need you to play, you're out there ready to play. And if you can't give me that, you shouldn't be out there. Y'all want him to cuddle, coddle, work around Kemba. Look, if you ready or you not, we got a guy that's ready. And this is the NBA. This is sports, y'all. Old Lions... Die. Young lions live. That's how it works. I'm sorry, but that's how it works. Okay? You got young lions challenging LeBron now. He 37. He wants to be out there? Okay. Young lions coming at him. Flushing it on him. Doing whatever they need to do on him. Because that's the way, that's the way sports is. Sports is like the animal kingdom. It really is. You want to be young and inexperienced? You get eaten up. Look at what happened to Kevin Knox. You want to be young and soft, you get eaten up. You old and you pass your time, you're going to get eaten up. It's the real in sports. Okay? You're a boxer and you're stepping out there and your reflex is not what they're supposed to be. Muhammad Ali, for example, had no business fighting Larry Holmes. He had no business fighting Larry Holmes. Whoever allowed him to do that should be sued. Because he was way done. Way done. Couldn't even, he was slurring his words after George Foreman. But you see, that's what happens. The last one to believe they done is the one themselves. Even though you, you know, you, you know, everyone else can see it. And it's not until something embarrassing happens. And I kind of understand. I mean, what, look, what, you know, you've been a great in a sport like basketball. They got to drag you off the court, right? They got to drag you off. But sometimes when you are hurting the team, it's a team. Now, team sport is different. Because you, in your reluctance to realize where you are in your career, you are hurting the team. So Kemba goes out there on one leg last night because he didn't want Deuce McBride to play his minutes. Because you know what would have happened? Like I said. Here's Deuce McBride going plus 39 last night. He didn't score a point, but the team was completely different with him on the floor. And you know, and we'll go into why in a second, but that's the situation now. And normally you have seen, and I have seen Tom Thibodeau will use mob deep just enough to get a lead to bring them fools of the first unit back in, especially Julius Randle, put him back in the game. And then the league gets cut and we try to hang on to win. 
Right? Last night he didn't do that. He did not do that. He left them all. This is the first. I think y'all tell me if I'm wrong. But I think this is the first game Obi Toppin finishes a game in the fourth quarter that we need to win. I think this is the first time he does that. To me, the spiritual leader of Mob D is Derrick Rose. But the energy leader is Obi Toppin. Right? He, to me, represents Mob Deep. It ain't Mob Deep unless you got both of them in there, but Dirk obviously is out, but it's not Mob Deep unless Obi's in there. And he closed last night, which tells me something. We'll talk about that, but it tells me something about Tom. We'll talk about that. Now let's talk about Mr. Randall. I wanted y'all to hear from me, because some of y'all have to trust these guys before you listen to what I'm trying to tell you. And I never hardly agree with these cats. I don't, <laughs> but they speak in my language here last night. Julius Randle is a different player than he was last year. He is Julius. Not, I can't even say he's Julius of 2019. Honestly, he's Julius of New Orleans Pelicans. And look at last year, even. The Knicks were 500 or below 500 before Derrick Rose came. And when Derrick Rose came, there was that same hype and hoopla that kind of you see with Kemba because it was that Rose and Thibodeau reunion. And Julius played better. He respects Derrick Rose. And he played a lot better with Derrick Rose. Does he respect Kemba? I don't know. He definitely did. See, I'm telling y'all, y'all saw, cause he took Kemba's the heart and soul of our team. That was some BS. He didn't want Kemba there. And last night, <clears throat> I saw some, see, I'm starting to see some very disturbing things. The lack of effort, the nonchalant attitude. That's why the first, see, look, let's talk about this now. Let's be real about it. All right. I'm trying to be fair and real all the time. Some of y'all don't like it and you think when, when I'm hurting your, your favorite guy, whoever, that I'm trying to pick on. I'm not picking on anybody. I want the Knicks to win. Look, the first unit. During the course of this season, the Knicks have replaced the point guard. They have replaced the shooting guard. A couple Last night, Fournier was out. R.J. Barrett has been out because he was sick, remember? Even before COVID, he was out because he was sick. He had caught a flu or something. They had Mitchell Robinson coming in the second unit and Dirk Nerlens Noel starting. So they have replaced at least one player in the first unit of all the players except one. When they replaced Kemba with Alec Burks, we still stunk. When RJ Barrett was sick and they had somebody else in there, we still stunk. When they put Nerlens Noel in for Mitchell Robinson, we still stunk. When they replaced Evan Fournier with Grimes, who we know could play, we stunk. What's the one constant that has been in the starting unit all year without being replaced? And that, my friends, is your problem in the first unit. That's it. The problem is Julius. Now, I don't think that comes as a surprise to anybody for me to say the problem in the first unit is Julius Randle. But what I've been saying all year, which I know you all agree with, the Knicks are not taking him out the first unit. So now we're going to continually have a first unit problem because we're going to continually have Julius Randle in the first unit. And Tom is not taking him out. The only way Randle comes out, if he's sick or hurt, that's it. And that's going to lead to what we already know is going to be an Obi Toppin problem. Um, I was going to talk about that today, but I forgot there was a game last night, but I'm going to talk about it more tomorrow. But I want, I've been telling several of y'all, which I want you to keep in your mind regarding Obi Toppin and Julius Randle. Leon Rose runs the Knicks. He is above everybody else. The only person above him is James Dolan. And Dolan give him the keys. OK. 
Okay. So he's running the Knicks. He's the most powerful man in the basketball side of the Knicks right now. All right. James Dolan did not choose Obi Toppin. When the eighth pick came, you had Tyrese Halliburton, Devin Vassell available. There were other players available. But Leon chose, Leon chose Obi Toppin. And afterward, we found out Leon was willing to trade up to get Obi. That's why I knew if you remember that night, I actually did a live, live uh, screen, live thing during the, the draft. And when I saw Cleveland pick Okoro, I knew the Knicks were getting Obi Toppin. And because Leon wanted him, Leon wanted Obi. Who brought Randall here? Was it Leon? Leon was an agent with the same agency. Both Obi and Randall have the same agency. Creative artists. So that's not relevant. That's, that cancels each other out. But no, it was Steve Mills and Scott Perry that bought Julius Randall here. So let me ask you a question then. You're in the front office. Can you imagine? They're in the front office. It's obviously Julius is, is a problem. Do you think that Leon going to say, oh, I'll trade Obi so that we can let Julius flourish. D do you think that's going to happen? If there's an argument between Tom Thibodeau and Leon Rose about Obi and Julius, who wins the argument? Do you see where I'm going? So for now, Julius is going to be a fixture. They got to figure a way. I don't know what they're going to do, but all year, I can tell you right now, the bench is going to have to save the Knicks all year. So what you're going to try to do is alleviate the Julius Randle problem in your first unit. Okay, that's what you're going to have to try to do. Let's talk about it from Julius's perspective. Does he see himself as a problem? Well, let me go over last night, a, a, a small incident last night. That tells a lot. Just like the incident we saw the other night where OB commits a turnover and Tom goes buck wild and, and Julius commits multiple bonehead plays and Tom doesn't even look or blink. There was a similar situation, but it didn't involve Tom. If you remember, they had to put Manuel quickly in. IQ came in for Kembass at one point. So IQ was playing with the first unit for a while. And there was a defensive uh, three seconds. And they had to shoot a technical. IQ's a 92% foul shooter. It's no question he's supposed to shoot the technical, but Julius Randle runs to the foul shot to shoot the, to shoot the ball. That told me a lot. If you want your team to win, your team, there's no question. Quick, go shoot that ball, man. No, but he runs there. Why? He needs the stats. And I've been noticing it for a few games now. At the end of games, he's still trying to score. In fact, he's trying harder than when the game was really on the line. He wants the stats. What am I saying? He's stat chasing. That's what I'm saying. That's a bad sign, y'all. That, that's a really bad sign. So you got a combination of the coach coddling him and him stat chasing and being disengaged with his teammates. I can see a major problem here. Not going to be solved this year, though. Not going to be solved this season. Maybe next season. Maybe. Because I'm telling you right now, Obi Toppin wins the battle because of Leon Rose. Obi Toppin wins that battle. They did not draft Obi Toppin for him to be playing behind a guy that's acting selfish. If he's playing behind an all-NBA player, okay. What you going to do? He's all-NBA. But it's looking more and more like last year got to his head. Like last year messed him up. Can he change? Yes, he can. The question is, will he? Meantime, the Knicks are going to struggle with this guy. Now, let's talk about the game. So, the big story, obviously, Alec Burks was the MVP, right? I mean, obviously, right? I mean, he... 
he comes in and, and, you know, whatever his issue, remember now his woman was having a baby, right? So he had a baby a couple of weeks ago and he was off. Y'all, y'all know he was a little off. His shooting was not that great. But I always told y'all we don't want to lose Alex. Why did I say we don't want to lose Alex? Some of y'all remember. I said because he's fourth quarter, he's clutch, and you're going to want him in the playoffs. Isn't that what I said? I said he's fourth quarter, he's clutch, you don't want to lose Alec Burks. And last night show why. 12 of 17 from the four, 5 of 8 from 3, 5 of 5 from, he busted out of this slump big time. 34 points, most of them in the fourth quarter. He was big time last night, but it wasn't just him, as you saw, right? It was him with the unit. So, Obi scored nine points, right? You didn't, the stats don't jump out to you. Nine points, four boys, one assist, one steal, right? But if you saw the game, the energy, the attention he draws, he was plus 36. Obi, Taj Gibson only scored four points. Eight boards, two assists, but you saw Taj Gibson all over the floor, especially on defense. Plus 31. Deuce McBride, our soon-to-be point guard. And I'm telling you, somebody, somebody was putting last night, somebody wrote some stupid article talking about, well, now that the team comes back, you know, there's going to be no place for McBride. And I put my comment and I said, in two weeks, he's going to be the starting point guard. I did it yesterday. In two weeks, he's going to be the starting point guard. And I still stick to that. In two weeks, he's going to be the starting point guard. Why? Look, man, I told you. <laughs> Let this kid get some minutes, and it'll be obvious. He's plus 39. See, sometimes plus minus don't tell you something. But if you actually saw last night's game, you know it tells you something. The team was 39 points better with Deuce McBride on the floor. Why? Did you see when he came in the game, how the defense changed? How he picks up their guards, three quarter court, full court, and causes them to have a problem coming across the court. Now they got, instead of 24 seconds, they may have 16, 17 seconds to run their offense. And he's pestering the guard with the ball. And not only that, he only is credited with two steals. But if you watch the game, he caused four or five steals because he caused them to make bad passes or to rush a pass or, you know, so. And I think he had four assists. They only created him with three, but he had he, the couple of times he could have shot the ball and he swung it to a more open Alec Burke because he knew Alec was hot. That's IQ, man. That's high IQ ball. There's your starting point guard. It's not Emmanuel Quickly. Look, Emmanuel Quickly was aggressive last night. But he, he, you know, 4 of 13, 2 of 7 from the three-point line. He scored 18 points, but homie was gunning. I mean, he was gunning. He is definitely tailored to be a shooting guard. There is no question. And a shooting guard off the bench. That's Emmanuel quickly. At least at this stage. Maybe later in his career he'll de <clears throat> develop more of an all-round game for a point guard. He's not a point guard. Deuce McBride's a point guard. And and he played the game so smart. He didn't force anything. You see, try to make moves and whoever was on him wasn't moving. And he couldn't get moves. So get rid of the ball. Get rid of the basketball. Plus 39. Alec Burks was only plus 28 because he had played with the first unit. <laughs> we'll get into them in a second. And then, of course, quickly plus 27. I mentioned him already. Quickly bring the energy, too. That's the thing about him. It's not his shooting, necessarily. He bring the energy. Him and, and that's what makes him, and y'all know him and Obi tight because they've been working together all summer. They bring the energy, man. The energy that we need to get everything rolling. Julius is so nonchalant and, 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 and looking lazy and walking around the court. He destroys the energy. He really does. He just destroys the energy, man. That's why the first unit is struggling and it's going to continue to struggle. Randall, minus 27. Minus 27. 
2 for 11, 0 for 3. And I know he was mad he didn't get in at the end of the fourth quarter. Tom was trying to win that game last night. Because, you know, if you lose to Detroit, and somebody was, in Twitter was like, oh, they should, they should run away with this one. They gonna, I said, don't say that. This is the NBA. Anybody can beat anybody on any given night. This is the NBA. And so, but even so, they still going in. Everybody expects them to win. Detroit's missing. You know, all their key players are missing. And yet, here we were, down 14. Down 14. Thank you, Julius. Down 14. Mitchell Robinson scored seven points, had seven boards, had, had an assist. And again, what was he doing? Guard, whenever you see Mitchell Robinson in that scenario, just think, just remember, he's guarding two guys all the, all the time. If he gets in a scenario where you got the point of attack being protected and the wings being guarded, and you just ask him to rim protect just in case you get beat. Now you're going to see him get 18 rebounds. You're going to see him, you know, get his fourth. You're going to see that. Last night, he's guarding two guys all the time because Kemba's playing on one leg and Julius don't give a crap. It brings down the whole five. You know, so you could look at it like this. Kemba's giving, you know, he got heart. Yeah, he got heart. He does. Like I said, he's 100% out there when he's out there. But he shouldn't have been out there. And he knows he shouldn't have been out there. But again, he's worried about his spot. Because he knows. You give Deuce McBride 30 minutes a night for three nights. That's all you need, three games. And it's done. He's never coming back. to. You would never get Deuce, Deuce out the lineup once you do that. You would never get him out the lineup. Kemba knows that. Him and Deuce be talking. You see on the side, they be talking. He knows Deuce has great respect for him. And when Kemba mentioned young players watching me, I know one of those was Deuce McBride. Remember, he was sitting, and they, he said, I don't like it, but I got to be a role model. You know? And I like that. You know, obviously, Kemba's a, he's a good dude, man. And so he's like, you know, people are watching me. I got to, I got to, you know, be positive so that I could be an example. And I think one of those, again, was Deuce. And he talked with Deuce. And he knows what Deuce could do. Everybody in the Knicks know what Derrick Rose, he said, Deuce? He said, we see it every day in practice. I hope Tibbs give him more minutes. They want to win. So Kemba is minus 21. He scores two points. He's playing on one leg out there and he wasn't, he can't play defense. And when he's healthy, he has trouble, right? But at least he's trying. But when he's on one leg, forget about it. He can't even stick with G Lee, dude. RJ played, I thought RJ played well. He made some mistakes, but you see, I, I give RJ more of a pass. Y'all got to remember he's on his rookie deal. He's still on his rookie deal. Okay. He's not going to be a max guy. Uh uh-uh. uh. But I'm telling you, give him to age 25 and we're going to have a stud on our hands. And I'm not worried about RJ. He was the best one to me in the starting five last night. He scored 15, not just because of that. He had seven boards. He's trying to win. He's trying to play for the team. He's not stat chasing like Julius. He's not playing on one leg like Kemba. He's not sometimey like Fournier. He's going to give you his effort all the time. Okay? And so... You know, he was minus 29 because he was playing with them. That's why. You surround R. You put RJ in the second unit and put the second unit as the starters and watch what happens. Quentin Grimes, 0 for 5, you know, 13 minutes. He just, I don't know what happened. I just, he just wasn't, they just wasn't in sync. He was still out there hustling, trying to play his defense. He he was actually the best one of the starters. He was minus 17. He said, I think it's only because he played 13 minutes. If he had played 25, he'd be with the rest of them. But again, we have seen Grimes do work when he's not on the floor with Julius. So, yeah, there's going to be changes, got to be changes. But let's talk about what's not going to happen. Julius is going to start. Obi is not going to start. There's going to be a problem next year. Next summer, oh my God, you're going to hear all kinds of rumors. No, next summer is going to be interesting. But, and depending on how the Knicks finish, so Obi's going to be in the second unit. He's there. That's him. He's going to get hit. Last night he got 22 minutes. I'm hoping that Thibodeau decides to continue to close with Obi like he did last night. He closed with Obi. And he claimed that the reason he took Obi out and he only played 11 minutes the other night because he was just coming back from COVID. That's what he said. He said he's still working his way back from COVID. Okay. Last night he played 22 minutes. And he needed to play all 22 for us to win the basketball game. Taj Gibson, 28. I can't, you know, 
I don't want Taj is in a, in a way like Kemba and not what, listen here. When I say that, I mean like this, he's an older player. You can't be expecting him to play 30 minutes every night. But in a night like last night where you need that, you know, you don't have uh, Jer- uh, Jericho Sims. You don't have Nerlens Noel. And Mitchell Robinson's played 20 minutes. And, you know, and, and you know, he could have ran Mitchell Robinson with them. But, t- but Taj was doing work with that second unit. So you, you, you put him out there in that scenario. But you don't want to do that every night if you don't have to. You want to save him for, really, he's another guy you want in the playoffs. Okay, you want Taj doing this type of work in the playoffs. And he will do that. Okay, I want to keep him wrapped in plastic and just break him out when I need him because I know I can depend on him. I don't want to have to play him 30 minutes every night. But he was dynamite last night. And then, of course, Deuce. That's the starting point guard. Deuce McBride. Okay, I don't want to see Kemba out there no more. And this not again, I'm not hating on Kemba. Deuce is ready. Let's do this. Y'all want to win, don't you? (laughs) Deuce is ready. Put him out there. Okay, Burks, I like him in the second unit. Quickly in the second unit. See, so now you can, to me, when D Rose gets back, and that's going to be a minute. We ain't going to see D Rose for two months, right? But so right now you're talking about quickly, Burks, um, hopefully you get a Jericho Sims and Nerlens Noel back, but we can use Gibson for now, uh, topping. Quickly, Burks, Gibson, topping. Okay. My starting unit should be Deuce, Grimes, Barrett, Robinson, Julius Randle. That should be your starting unit. Um, I don't know what Fournier, they, they said he hurt his ankle or whatever. I hope his ankle stay hurt for a couple more games. <laughs> Let these kids run, man. I hope his ankle stay hurt for a little bit longer. So, and what about Kevin Knox? Well, I would put Kevin Knox in the second unit. Especially if I, if I, if I'm sending, if I'm discarding Fournier, I'm putting Kevin Knox in the second unit. Okay. He got a DMP CD last night and in a game against Detroit, you could have played him Julius Randle's name. Probably would have been better. We probably would have, I'm not joking. We probably would have been better. But anyway, so some of y'all are going to ask, what about a trade? Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I could see them trading Kemba, but who, I mean, He's got a bum knee. So, I mean, look, if you play in Kemba in the second unit, I think you'd be good. 15 minutes a night, I think that's really good for him. But I don't think he's going to get that on the Knicks. So maybe he is going to get traded. I don't know. But he can't be a starter like this. You can't be, you know, you don't know what you're getting from night to night. Is his knee going, is he going to play? He's going to want to play all the time because he don't want Deuce to take his place. So is he going to play on one leg and hurt you? And you combine that with you don't know what kind of mental condition Julius Randle's going to be in when he shows up to play. You got those two big question marks, man. You just don't know. He ain't going to say anything because he wants to play. But it was obvious last night he's playing on one leg. Okay. So I don't know. You know, I really don't know. I, cause, cause last night, let me show you what I, what I did learn watching Thibodeau last night. So it's the third quarter. You could see the lead that the mob deep had given them in the second quarter dissipating quickly, right? It was coming, going away, right? Then all of a sudden they're down. First it was tied, then they were down, then they were down 14. And I'm like, Tom, what, what are you waiting for? It was like three minutes left in the third quarter when he put mob deep in the game. And I was like, why didn't he do that at six minutes, right? It was driving me crazy, but. What is he doing? There's gotta be, he's not, listen, let's, let's, let's get some things emotionally out of the way. Tom Tibble is not stupid. He's a professional NBA coach. He knows what the hell he's doing. Okay. More than you and me. So, so when you guys look at it like this, what is the, what is the modus operandi? What is the method to the madness? What is he trying to do? Well, he is definitely gathering intelligence. He is definitely and it's more than what we're seeing. Of course, he got guys behind him. They're videotaping. They're, they're taking notes. And he's going to come back and he's going to, they're going to caucus and they're going to go over what he saw. And that's what he's doing. Secondly, what I realized, and I was looking at the game and I thought this too. I thought he's going to have to play that mob deep unit the whole rest of the game. They're going to be tired. 
He wants to give them enough minutes so that they could come back. And also enough minutes so that they don't run out of gas. Because at the end of that game, he remember, he had to actually call a timeout. They were all tired, man. Because those guys were busting it up out there. They were running all over the floor, man. Deuce was tired. Taj was tired. All of them. They were beat. But he, I didn't want them taking him out, especially for Julius Randle, which he didn't. So, to me, he knew he was going to play them that last 12 minutes. And he gave them. And, and, man, as soon as they came in the game, as soon as they came in the game, the lead started dissipating. Detroit's lead. And then Alec Burks gets that three-point play, cuts it to seven. The buzzsaw had begun, right? And then within, I say within the first three or four minutes of the fourth quarter, we took the lead again. I mean, it was that quick, man. It was crazy. And so Tom knew that that was coming. So he's, but he's at the same time, he's gathering intelligence. And look, like I said, I noticed it. Wally freaking Zerbiak noticed it. Alan Hahn noticed it. So I'm saying, okay, we all seeing it. It's Julius Randle's the problem. Question now, what is Tom going to do? I don't know. He got to try, like I said, to, to me, the best thing is to start Deuce and Grimes together because now you have a couple of these youth out there and we saw Julius actually defer and give the ball. To Deuce when they were trying to win the Houston game. Maybe this will work then. Because when that fool start trying to dribble the ball up, we got problems. And then he arguing with the refs. Oh, see, he arguing with the refs. So Friday is going to be interesting. Oklahoma City is another team we should beat. But as we said last night, we say now, don't take anybody for granted. Don't take anybody for granted. We could get beat in Oklahoma. But I will say this. The only way we get beat is we beat ourselves. Detroit didn't have to be close to us last night. If he, if Julius Randle didn't play and if Kemba Walker didn't play, even if we would have, you know, blew them away with the rest of the squad. And you play Kevin Knox and you play Deuce more minutes, we'd have blew them away. And so that's the frustrating thing. When we're losing, we're only losing because we're beating ourselves because we're not playing the right crew. We got the talent to beat anybody. Okay. You saw Mitchell Robinson, 18 rebounds, another night, 17 rebounds, you know, five blocks one night. I mean, he, he's coming into shape. You got a monster right there. So <laughs> we got the crew. We just got to play the right pieces. Okay. So we'll see what happens. I don't know, but. If he plays Deuce and Grimes, keep, keep Grimes out there, keep Fournier, you know, resting his ankle, I think we should be okay. Um, but we got to see what happens. This is this is a drama that's unfolding. I hate drama in New York Knicks land. I hate it because the media loves it. They eat it and they cause and the Knicks nation bites it up like catnip. And then all of a sudden it becomes the focal point instead of basketball, right? Well, here we go. This is what's coming, y'all. So... Um, we'll review the game, preview the game tomorrow, but, and we're going to talk more about this OB situation, but, um, yeah, the Knicks win last night. This is the third straight game, I think. And they said it's the first time in eight years that they've held three opponents under 90 points. That's tremendous. Even though they are like G League affiliate type team, I don't care. They're supposed to do that. And so the defense was good, especially with mob deep. That defense is tight. And so, um, Let's hope they continue that in Oklahoma City. I don't want Oklahoma City to score. I'm, I'm just thinking if you keep them under 100, but they've been keeping cats under 90, man. So 94, 85, those are the type of games I like. I told you all that last week. So let's continue that. Um, we should be in good shape depending on who Tom decides to give the minutes to. We'll find out. But in the meantime, be safe out there. This is Thursday, like Friday for some of us. Be safe, be cool, enjoy yourself. Watch your back, though. Shalom.